Good afternoon, Andy Brockman. Afternoon, Mark. Good afternoon. Now, um, this afternoon, I am really eager to have a chat with you about the ethics uh, and the practicality, I suppose, surrounding the recovery of human remains in archaeology. Uh, and this conversation actually was inspired by a news article that I posted on the Archaeosuit Facebook page uh, last week, or over the weekend, I think. Um, and it uh, came from the Siberian Times, and it was a news article all about a essentially a frozen mummy. Some human remains of a young lady had been frozen in the permafrost, presumably, and had been recovered by archaeologists, and people were commenting on this. And there were two sets of comments. The first set of comments were on the news article itself. Uh, I think, for the most part, uh, people who read the Siberian Times uh, regularly, um, or semi-regularly, were commenting, talking about how these... Uh, basically, this, this was inappropriate. The, these so-called scientists shouldn't be digging up human remains. Um, how, you know, how would you feel if someone did this to you in only 900 years' time? This kind of thing. Uh, and, and there seemed to be a slight undercurrent, and I think it's reasonable for me, for me to, 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 to sort of detect this, an undercurrent of potentially sort of religiously driven concern for the, the integrity of the burial. So there was that. And then, but when I shared the news article on the Archaeosuit page, uh, people were commenting <clears throat> initially very, uh, I suppose, concerned, dispar you know, disparagingly, or, or even just confused about those co about those particular comments. They were saying, you know, it, it borders borders on ignorance. But then also actually, the, a conversation started where where people, uh, quite rightly, I suppose, started sort of playing devil's advocate, and there was they were asking questions like, well, what is the limit? Is there a is there a time limit on digging up human remains? Is it is it about you know is it seventy five years or is it human you know living memory or something like that? And uh, and I just thought it was a conversation that was worth expanding on really today. Uh, and in particular, uh, because I think archaeologists aren't that good, and they say aren't great uh, often at separating an archaeological site from uh, human remains in terms of data gathering. Uh, human remains are typically just seen as part of the data set, I think. I think you're right, and I think it's a really important issue, and I'm very pleased that we're actually talking about it today. Mm. I, um, I think it's one, I think it's the knottiest ethical issue, actually, that archaeologists have to deal with, mm. probably. Mm. It's, uh, certainly the one with the most traction with the wider public. Mm. And I think that perhaps we should start, really, with, you know, one of the most famous quotes about archaeology um, ever, which is some Autumn Wheeler, who said, archaeology is digging up people. Mm. There, there is no more intimate connection that we can have with the past, either as archaeolo archaeological practitioners um, or the people who look at the work we do, than to be face-to-face, -face, sometimes literally, with our predecessors on the planet. And Well, that's true, actually. And if you look at... Uh... For example, in preparation for this video, I looked at, uh, for example, you know, the the archaeology student bible, Rem from Barn. Um, I looked at a couple. I need of, to get a new edition, actually. Well, oh, so do I. My one. Mine's way out of date. Mine was <laughs> out of date when I bought it. <laughs> um, it was a poor student. Um, then, but if you're looking at that, looking at, at uh, other books, for example, Charlotte Roberts' uh, treatise on disease in the past uh, and other uh, osteological texts, they do tend to make that point that that human remains are the best literal evidence of populations in the past but it's interesting that none of those texts Renfrew and Barn included really touch on the question of of uh, I suppose the ethics but more to the point I suppose uh, there's no expect that th there's no uh, th the assumption is that human remains are just going to be recovered in archaeology that they are a necessary part of uh, of the data set now, now, in some ways, you can track, I suppose, the, the, the level of, of ethical concern, certainly in this country, when it comes to human remains, by looking at, say, the legislation. Um, uh, and so on. Exactly, yeah. So, so, so really, I mean, essentially, in, in, in the UK, the, um, the, the main piece of legislation that, that affected, or that, sorry, was applied to archaeological remains, um, human remains, <clears throat> was the uh, Burials Act 1857. And uh, the Home Office in the 20th century was applying this, this legislation that was really to do with uh, the public's exposure to extant 
graveyards and for example the act of burying people and whether or not people should be exposed to coffins and human remains and they apply... I think it's one of the one of the ironies of this isn't it that you know people are used to the idea of forensic archaeology in the forensic tent mm. and obviously that that is there on a on a on a site as it as in the police investigation um to protect the the evidence but at the same time it's also there to um, under the Act to protect the public from the possibility of seeing human remains in case they're offended or shocked or, or in some way upset. Well, exactly, and and so and so to that end, the Home Office would issue a license traditionally, um, which would give the archaeologists the right uh, to, to to excavate human remains so long as certain provisions were 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 uh, catered for. So, for example, having a a bone specialist, an osteoarchaeologist on yeah. site, um, uh, ensuring that remains were were adequately recorded and investigated and where possible reinterred or certainly stored appropriately uh, in museums uh, or in a curated collection of some sort. Uh, so that, that used to be the case and then actually funnily enough in the last 10 years quite literally in the last decade in 2007 things uh, were sh shaken up. Uh, suddenly the, uh, the, the, this was no longer the responsibility of the Home Office and uh, for, for about a year archaeologists didn't require a license. In 2007-2008 uh, it was deemed that actually the, the ethics behind the handling of human remains could be dealt with by archaeologists alone. But then it didn't take long before the newly formed Ministry of Justice in 2008 uh, decided that, they, that, that, that uh, henceforth all human remains archaeologically excavated in England and Wales should be reburied after a two-year period of scientific analysis. And that really set a cat among the pigeons, didn't it? Because I remember at the time the concern amongst our, our colleagues, particularly colleagues who deal with human remain, remains routinely, hmm. uh, that that was actually going to severely limit or even stop completely any kind of investigation of, 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 of human remains that turned up on archaeological sites. Well, yeah, and, and certainly it was it was going to it was going to stop the ability to revisit uh, initial mm -hmm. findings. <clears throat> so people may well be able to do uh, 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 within those two years a set of certain tests, but future analyses and and comparative analyses were were were, were impossible. And also, actually, specific, uh, unique, uh, maybe pathological or so pathological sorry conditions, um, uh, illnesses of, of the bone, this kind of thing, couldn't be kept, for example, as case studies in museums. So in 2010, 2011, this reached a hiatus, and uh, people wrote, uh, notably professors in, in archaeology and other related sciences, wrote a, a publication, uh, no, sorry, an open letter, sorry, in The Guardian to uh, the minister who was then um, linked with this, Ken Clark, essentially pointing out this problem, pointing out that actually um, mandatory reburial of all human remains simply was impractical. I mean, I think when I first started thinking about this issue a few days ago, I was essentially with Rempro and Barn. I was going, well, it's just part of archaeology. Human, human remains is part of the data set. But, but you, you would have to be a fairly cold soul not to understand that actually there, there are, and there should rightly be, ethical considerations here. Uh, and I think... Um, uh, in particular, the, the closer we get in time, but also actually just in some respects, actually, the more specific we get when it comes to knowing uh, burial rituals, archaeologists should have an, in, uh, it's incumbent upon us to be aware of that. So, I mean, to that end, again, I'll put links below, um, Historic England have produced a series of PDFs, which outline, for example, some of these concerns in, in, in booklet form. So one of them would be, how do you properly go about sampling uh, a grave uh, a graveyard if you've got thousands of burials uh, not only in terms of statistical significance but also in terms of cultural sensitivity how do you actually manage that uh, another book was to do with another pdf sorry on that site is linked with the handling of um of specifically ancient christian remains so we know exactly what those people believed about their their human remains in particular this idea of the physical resurrection and this kind of thing uh how to handle that and also there are other other considerations for example how do you handle prehistoric remains and this is something which I, I think I find most interesting is that <laughs> there are some known knowns and some known unknowns as it were when it comes to prehistory so for example we know that in pre with, with prehistoric remains especially in the Neolithic there were bits of bodies floating around the community. People were very, uh, you know, bo bo bones and human remains were were, were um, part of almost like a living sphere, an exchange between the living and the dead. And so in that sense, it's it's really hard to, uh, to know what to do. I mean, I, I've, for example, once had someone approach me in a museum um, and I was talking about some human remains. 
And the person said, well, can't we just do the decent thing and give this person a Christian burial? And you're like, mm. well, no, actually, we can't. We can't. That, that arguably is unethical. And yeah. so it's, it, it, is a, it is quite a minefield. And also, I, 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 I mean, I'll, come, I'll, I'll ask you a question in just a second, but I'm also reminded of the fact that in some respects, archaeology is a bit like medicine. You know, mm. it, a doctor cannot be trained unless they get to, to experiment with, and to a certain extent, uh, in a constructive way, play with human remains. They need to be able to explore uh, the pathology, the cause of death of of a range of different bodies in order to actually be able to, to be able to apply that their knowledge. And so, in some ways, archaeology can't be done without human remains either. But my question, though, you know, especially in your realm of expertise, is what is there a cutoff point, for example, when it comes to to uh, uh, conflict with you know, archaeology, um, where there's been battles? It's a really interesting point. I well, I, I would start from the point that, and I think in probably pretty much every jurisdiction in, in the world, uh, the discovery of human remains is a legal issue hmm. because hmm. you are uh, the moment you discover human remains, potentially, you could be dealing with a crime scene, mm -hmm. uh, and that's why the, you know the discovery, the, even the accidental discovery of human remains, is notifiable. Um, and is the comes under the jurisdiction in UK of the local coroner mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. working with the police, and uh, uh, and for archaeologists in most in instances, um, obviously it will be pretty obvious that you're dealing with a historic burial, and therefore and, and it's signed over to you, and there's no problem. No. But, uh, but but you you start from the point of view that you are in a, an area which is absolutely and quite rightly rightly regulated by law. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are other pieces of legislation in place, for example, the Protection of Military Remains Act, and you alluded to mm. that just now. But, um, uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I should make clear to everybody who's watching this that my, my experience, I'm, I'm not a, an osteologist, I'm not a, you know, a, a pathologist, uh, I, I don't routinely go out and, and, and work with human remains on archaeological sites. What I have done, though, is, is uh, been responsible for researching uh, appropriate methods and protocols and writing protocols for excavations where human remains uh, would actually be expected and obviously conflict and battlefield sites particularly 20th century ones um, that would be a routine expectation when it comes so you can gonna... well, because well, and presumably those remains will be found. You know, you can't necessarily guarantee that they'll be found where they're expected to be found. Absolutely. You also can't guarantee. Well, you almost certainly cannot guarantee that they'll be found. For example, in in one piece, they could be disarticulated. They could be scattered. In that sense, yeah. uh, it it is interesting how dealing with these remains uh, throws up. On the one hand, yeah, that sort of archaeological yeah. question of the puzzle. But on the other yeah. hand, there's a very strong ethical question of, of the handling of these remains and what that what that means, I guess. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the Protection of Military Remains Act, were, um, certainly uh, as it applies in the UK and in UK territorial waters, so that involves um, you know crashed military aircraft mm -hmm. in UK territorial waters, for example, um, it is absolutely clear that a... An aircraft, for example, is protected under the Protection of Military Remains Act. Uh, it can only be disturbed with a license from the Ministry of Defence Joint Casualty and Compassionate Centre. Mm. And if there is an expectation that uh, aircrew, for example, would still be present, the remains of aircrew might be present on board, they will not grant a license. Mm. Because mm. the expectation in the UK is that the whatever it is, the, 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 the grave of a service person who is missing is a sacred place and should not be disturbed, mm. um, should not be deliberately disturbed. Mm. Uh, other jurisdictions have different expectations. For example, in America, um, there is a policy of repatriating MIAs, missing mm. in action mm -hmm. personnel. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole department, uh, tri-service department of the Department of Defense, the Joint Military Accounting Command, um, which carries out projects all over the world, uh, most famously at the moment in places like Vietnam and Laos mm. and Cambodia. Mm. Um, so, uh, uh, but and also there was, Britain, there was Britain's a... gone down. Uh, Britain has gone down a different route. But you know, mm. it, uh, I think it just goes to show that really the complexity that, 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 that e e even when we're talking about the archaeological ethics of this and the archaeological legislation, uh, it's different all over the world. Mm. 
yeah. people, you know, um, and um, we have to take that into account when we're discussing the issue as well. Well, and then I suppose bringing it even closer to us, if we're talking about this question of a cut-off point, uh, as you alluded to at the beginning of the video, there is a uh, there is a, a a very strong awareness at the moment because of programs like CSI and you know other procedural television dramas, where actually um, humour remains a play a big role in in the uh, the detection of crime. Um, sometimes you're dealing with literally mur people who have been murdered. And mm. that the forensic anthropologist, and, uh, and indeed there will, you know, the, 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 in fact, I, I know people who teach these courses. Uh, mm. They have such a, a such a tremendous, I suppose, li it's, a, it's an ironic term, but a live pressure upon them to yeah. to try and do justice to those remains by by interfering with them, by examining them, and it's only actually through taking them away from where they've been found, taking them to a laboratory and looking at them carefully, that actually that the, the, the hopefully justice can be served. But certainly the facts surrounding the death, and that's really the job of the forensic anthropologist, Absolutely. can be established. Now, yeah. now, now, now you've got that, but then interesting, this reminds me, and this is something which I think I know you'll find interesting, this reminds me very much of Richard III. Aha, yes. Because you had a similar situation there, didn't you, in so much as he was very he, he was treated like a it was treated like a crime scene in that sense absolutely um and uh, i mean certainly e even just in the in the mood music of the whole whole discovery uh, and it's partly to do with the way richard iii is perceived by certainly a proportion of the people who carry out research into that period mm -hmm. richard is seen as a victim richard mm. is the victim of the uh, of, of the victory of henry tudor at the Battle of Bosworth, and he was, you know, he was maligned in uh, and, and was maligned in death by Tudor propaganda. That argument goes, mm -hmm. and um, it's now clear from the forensic um, examination that was has been published in great deal, uh, great, great, great detail, and uh, commendably quickly, that uh, Richard's body was uh, well, certainly his death was traumatic and. He was then his body was then violated afterwards again in a in a quasi ritual way that he, his body was stripped thrown over the back of a horse and he was stabbed in the backside mm. twice I think if I, if I remember correctly as a ritual humiliation mm. um, you know which is sort of horrible to say it's sort of standard practice in that kind of warfare mm. uh, and has carried on um, the, you know the defilement of the remains of defeated enemies has carried on in into modern times and there have even been cases where allegations have been made for example against British and American service people in Iraq and Afghanistan about mm. similar sorts of things so again we, you know we, we're potentially also dealing with quite dark areas of human nature but yeah coming back to Richard I mean mm. the, the, the uh, one of the things again I found curious about that or interesting about that is that Richard's death and particularly there's particularly you know dark and unpleasant and upsetting aspects of it have been dealt with in full detail whereas if a modern member of the royal family of whom he's a you know he's a, 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 a descendants albeit not direct ones um the, their, their medical histories and so uh, are um uh limited to uh, in terms in terms of the, the public are limited to sort of brief and usually fairly uninformative press releases um uh, well but also so as well they're, they're, but but also as well, the, 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 uh, it's interesting how the, the particular interest in in Richard's remains uh, only exists because he is a named individual. It is interesting, and this is where again we come back to this line between ethics and data set, whereby other remains from the period, if they're not named oh, the, individuals, the, the most famous case is the is, is the mass grave uh, of, of individuals who were killed at the Battle of Towton. Hmm. Um, who again were uh, were looked at in forensic detail, and, and in fact some of the similar pathologies to the ones that were identified on Richard, hmm. Richard's remains, mm -hmm. uh, were identified on these remains as well. Um, but because they are not named individuals, they're anonymous soldiers who were either killed in the battle, killed in the route afterwards, or deliberately murdered hmm. after hmm. they've been taken prisoner for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, ending up in a mass grave, that, that they are the anonymous witnesses, and they can only be given a voice through archaeology and forensic anthropology. Mm. Uh, whereas, obviously, Richard ha has 
lots of other voices commenting on him as an individual apart from his remains. We now have that unique voice mm. of Richard's remains that can talk to us too. But I think the other interesting thing about that, and you were talking about burials earlier on, um, two things that struck me about the, the, the burial of Richard, that's once the argument had been sorted out between York and Leicester as, as to who wanted the tourist attraction. Sorry, sorry, who wanted to bury the remains of the king. Um, Richard was eventually buried in Leicester, mm -hmm. Leicester Cathedral, mm -hmm. um, which is the closest place, uh, uh, appropriate burial site to the place where he was discovered, which is exactly what the licensing expectation <clears> is when a, when a, when a human's remain, human remains license is granted to an archaeologist. The license but, is as now issued by the Ministry of Justice, yeah. Indeed, indeed. Mm -hmm. Um, but the expectation is that the place of reburial will be the, cl the, the nearest appropriate place of reburial mm -hmm. to the place where the remains are discovered. Mm -hmm. um, and the second thing is that he was laid to rest under, uh, uh, or, or, uh, against the background of a, a 1485 liturgy, which um, was researched on the grounds of what would he expect as a Roman Catholic in England at that period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's a, that attempt to almost... Think yourself back into into that um, in, in, into that mindset and and, and 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 meet an expectation which is only there because we've created it. And I suppose that is exactly what I was <clears throat> what I was getting at when I when I say because he's a named individual, in so mm. much as uh, the public, uh, frankly historians themselves, everyone was able to focus in on and uh, dare I say slightly fetishize and um, certainly fantasize about what it is that, that that would could have been done and what they might do now for this person whereas uh i suppose i suppose my question is or, or, or one of the things that interests me is are people uh actually bothered about uh the idea of human remains in general being uncovered or is it just that when they when they have points on which to focus their interest and the reason why I say this is that, uh, again, in Britain, for example, when we have um, prehistoric remains, sometimes you'll you'll hear from uh, people who uh, who claim to be druids or from the, from a new age lobby or something, getting very uptight and very angry about about how remains are treated and how and, and are interpreted surrounding, for example, uh, megalithic monuments, and yet. But uh, if you compare that, for example, to to the concerns and the struggles of, say, native populations in Australia and America, um, it's it's almost laughable in so much as there's no provable direct connection between the extant concern and the ancient remains. Whereas actually, uh, there is, for example, in the case of you know, say, a Navajo burial in the U.S. It's interesting how uh, how I suppose what I, I'm always concerned about what people and why people. Uh, get particularly angry when it comes to human remains, and what 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 what's their agenda? If you so to mean, and I don't mean that in a in a cynical way. I'm just I'm just, you know, curious. I think that's a very interesting point. I mean, certainly there have been cases, and the famous case in the United States is the Kennewick man, who mm -hmm. I think is about eight thousand years old mm -hmm. by date ar archaeological dating, and there was an almighty row after that particular uh, discovery because the Native American people who currently, uh, uh, in whose area the Kennewick remains were, were, were recovered, um, claimed that he claimed him as an ancestor mm -hmm. and that uh, the remains should be reburied according to the tribal right and so on. Archaeologists were countering that and saying, well, look, actually, archaeologically, we've got no evidence that the people, the Native people who are there currently have any relationship with the Native people who were there 8,000 years ago mm. and actually uh, while we respect you you know your right to say for example more recent burials this is actually or should be uh, outside of the jurisdiction because of its age and, 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 and the evidence and, and, and you know that 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 row ran for years um, mm. Mm. And, and still crop you know variations on it still, still crop up from, from, from time to time it you know, again, all of this I think shows we're in a particularly knotty area, and there is no mm. single simple answer that you can put down the code of practice. No, no, it, it, precisely, precisely, and and I wasn't bringing any of that up again in a cynical way. It was more a case of just, as you say, and and, and it, eventually it comes down to this question uh, of 
well, first of all, the fact that people always, people often seem to feel strongly that human remains are somehow owned by someone, mm -hmm. if you see what I mean. Um, yeah. and, or they certainly are, in many respects, um, they belong somewhere. People often consider human remains as being as belonging somewhere. But then there's this there, there is this question of who who is best placed to 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 deal with that and how they deal with that. And I would humbly submit, and here we come back around to the very beginning premise, that it's yeah. archaeologists. So long as we're having these conversations all the time, uh, and I think uh, I, I, I suppose one one thing I would just sort of add to this is that you know, like over the summer and in recent years, I've, I've visited archaeological sites where human remains have been found. And it's fair to say, and this isn't this isn't a criticism. This is just human nature. It's fair to say that archaeologists do slip. We do slip into kind of forgetting that we're dealing with human burials. We sort of slip into handling skeletons as artifacts and as an extension of the data set. And and uh, even for example, I mean, I remember the very first skeleton I excavated. I because I was an inexper inexperienced archaeologist. I you know, wasn't even an archaeologist technically. I was a you know, before I went to uni, uh, I I gave uh, in my head I gave this this being this person a name so that I wouldn't forget. It wouldn't it wouldn't yeah. just be a ge geometric exercise of okay, well this is the skull, so I'll just excavate this shape here and you see what I mean. And I think I think so long. Hopefully, so long as we're always challenging that and we're not slipping too far into the abstraction of human remains, then hopefully we're more than just so-called scientists. If you see what I mean. I, 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 I agree with you absolutely on that. I think, uh, and it's probably worth mentioning a couple of other very quick um, mm -hmm. sort of um, points and case studies. Um, I think there's a very basic uh, issue here that it's part of the scaffolding that underlies this whole thing, I think, mm. where uh, you know, in, in, in medieval religious terms, if you like, mm. every time an archaeologist, whether they're, a, uh, whatever they're, faith but belief or, 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 or none mm -hmm. um, when you are working on the remains of another person uh, from you know a soldier who was lost in World War two a soldier who was lost in World War one somebody whose life ended thousands or even tens of thousands of years ago we're looking at a memento mori in medieval terms a, rem mm. a reminder that that's where we all end up mm. Mm. and um, you even hear archaeologists joke from time to time, you know, I, you know, I'll, 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 I'm going to be buried with some Roman coins in my pocket to really confuse them when they come and dig me up. You know, um, doesn't show much faith in their colleagues' ability, does it? <laughs> no, absolutely. <laughs> and unfortunately, you won't be able to be around to read the report and enjoy the joke. Yeah. But um, the, uh, but you know, in all seriousness, uh, you know, we have a, a, a that sense of. Um, importance, reverence, if you want to use a word like that, sometimes for human remains. You go to the British Museum, and I think the most one of the most popular galleries is still the Egyptian Mummy Gallery, and one of the most popular exhibits there, is, oh, there's always people two or three deep around it, is the one that's is, is the exhibit that's nicknamed Ginger, which is the pre-dynastic crouch burial that, that is on display hmm. in, 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 the, in the British Museum. At the same time, I think we also have to acknowledge that particularly among people who routinely work in difficult and traumatic situations and work with, again, with human beings in extremis, there's a dark humour that creeps in and that's a psychological defence mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, I remember my mum, who was a trained nurse, telling me that when she was training in, uh, uh, in the 1950s, they had a skeleton in the nurse's wing at Ealing Hospital where she was training. Um, articulated skeleton, which they use for uh, teaching anatomy, and it was the habit of the nurses to be photographed with the arm of the skeleton round their neck. Mm -hmm. And in fact, their sister tutor came in one day and, uh, and 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 called them out on it, saying, "You remember that that you know, he was you know, that he was a person once. He, it, it was given a sex, and he was called Jimmy. In fact, mm -hmm. by everybody, mm -hmm. even though they didn't know if that was really his name or not, but he was called, he was always called Jimmy. So that, 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 that there's that, and and I've heard other stories uh, about situations like that, which I, I won't repeat in this podcast, but yeah. are about people dealing with very traumatic situations. Yeah, um, where you, as somebody who's not party to, thankfully to having to deal with something like that, you think, uh, what? Mm. You know, mm. 
but that wasn't done out of it, 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 those those actions and those things weren't said out of disrespect. They were said to defend your yourself, if you yeah. like, in in, a, in an emotionally trying circumstance. And I'm thinking, you know, uh, uh, archaeologists, for example, who've had to deal with the clearance of uh, the late 18th, early 19th crypts at Spitalfields Church mm -hmm. uh, were dealing with, you know, not a nice, clean, anatomically recognisable, you know, skeleton. Um, they were dealing with very well-preserved remains in sealed coffins and sometimes, and, you know, in, in some kind of, in cases, people who um, died in quite awful circumstances or of you know disease like tuberculosis and uh, smallpox where um, the you know, pathogens might still be um, live and ha having to treat them as biohazards so you know your 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 part of your data set might also be a biohazard might also be a psychological a, a, a psychological um, challenge as it were yeah. challenge to mm. you and, and 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 so on so again we're we're in a, in a very complex area there's one other thing i would say on um you talk about cutoff points earlier and before we um finish and i mentioned the protection of military remains act and the the assumption that people uh, m missing service personnel will be left alone um obviously routinely the, the people who are recovered in places particularly in places like france the british and commonwealth service personnel um, of which are the ones I've got the most knowledge of, um, they are effectively, in, 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 in agricultural terms, they're part of the bycatch. People don't go out looking for human remains on World War One and World War Two sites. But inevitably, because of uh, the nature of the sites you're looking at, sometimes their remains will turn up, and it, you ethically, you absolutely have to be ready to deal with them. But the the Ministry of Defence's policy of otherwise leaving missing personnel in situ, to use the archaeological term, can sometimes be actually offensive to the families who know through family history, through particularly the modern interest in genealogy, and we've just had the uh, commemoration for the 100th anniversary of the beginning of the Third Battle of Ypres, or Passchendaele as it's often better known as, um, where there are tens of thousands of missing personnel just on the British and Commonwealth side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the idea of not deliberately not looking for them um, is sometimes seen as an offensive. These are people who often volunteered or, or certainly you know, went into battle for king and country in 1917, say, mm -hmm. um, pay the ultimate price for that and there's a sense that they're actually owed a decent burial um, and why shouldn't we go looking for them hmm. um, and so, so this also happened over for example Battle of Britain aircrew yes yeah yeah uh, well and, and so in that sense I suppose um, maybe a, po a point to, to bring this to a close on it is is that element of the fact that the human remains always represent a challenge Yes. Whether the challenge is simply confronting one's own mortality, or dealing with a potential biohazard, or uh, or for example, as you say, I mean, yes, archaeologists do often have a fairly morbid sense of humour surrounding this sort of stuff. Um, but also as well, the challenge is there in terms of uh, what the recovery of remains means, uh, what it means to, for example, have a mummy on display in the British Museum. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and I, I suppose all these different facets linked with the recovery of remains. It's one of those things where those those, those people who call for for, for archaeologists just to cease you know, cease your grave robbing. Yeah, you know, first of all, we're not grave robbing, <laughs> um, precisely because of all these considerations that we've been talking about. But also, secondly, uh, as you say, uh, there is there is a very strong argument that in many cases actually uh, ignoring human remains is to do them a disservice as well. And so, and so, as I say, I, I, I would hope, I would hope, and maybe this is something which I need to, you know, return to in on this YouTube channel is maybe interview other people and just chat about human remains, and perhaps actually returning to people like Charlotte Roberts as well. But I would hope that that uh, that in having these conversations, in continuing to challenge ourselves, and also as well actually calling out bad behaviour. I mean, for example. Yes. You know, I've seen bad behaviour on archaeological sites. I've seen people, people have actually they've sent archaeo soup. You know, funny photos uh, of of human remains that they've been playing with with sunglasses and this kind of thing 
and calling that out as well all of this will keep us hopefully on an even keel and as i say stop us from being quacks or amateurs or or, or i mean in particular that, that phrase that so-called scientists phrase mm. um so yes, yeah, so it's a to it's a topic that that I yeah I really wanted to talk about today. So thank you, thank you for helping yeah. me. Well, no, thank you. I mean, can, can I make just one very quick point just to to finish from from my my, my perspective? Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, um, two two very quick points. What one is, I think one of the areas we have to watch very carefully is the exploitation of human remains on the media. Mm -hmm. We we we've gone from uh, probably the first significant. Um, exploration of, of that was Julian Richards' series Meet the Ancestors, which was forensic and archaeological and very cool and academic. Uh, and we're now and, and well, for those people at home, uh, just to explain, mm -hmm. at the end of each episode, there would be a reconstruction of someone's face based on Indeed. their skull. And so Indeed. you were literally meeting an ancestor, yeah? yeah. Indeed. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but we've gone from that to a, for example, the TV series that we shall not name, Nazi War Diggers, aka Battlefield Recovery, where the non-forensic recovery of battlefield remains was central to the program and caused an ethical storm. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that it had been first of all commissioned and uh, uh, in the face of archaeological advice and then shown. Mm -hmm. um, and we may be going there again with other programs in future. So the, 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 there was that point. But the final point I'd make is the absolute fundamental one, which is that, and it's where I began really, um, any of us dealing with human remains First of all, we have to do it absolutely clearly within the legal framework which pertains at the time. Mm -hmm. I think also, though, that the, and, and the importance of archaeologists having this kind of conversation, both amongst ourselves, but also looking out and having the conversation with the various publics mm -hmm. that we've discussed in the course of this chat, mm -hmm. and, and, and as archaeologists we purport to enrich by our work, that we have the discussion with them as well so that the law when it's framed is framed in the most effective and enlightened way possible mm. that's yeah. i think I, th I think that's where i i i I'd, I'd end um that you know i think i think th those two things are fundamental to how we deal with human remains in archaeology mm. and so and so therefore just to clarify that then so therefore mm. uh, also in that sense considering those people who do uh hurl hurl scepticism and in some cases abuse at archaeologists including those people as part of that constituency as well so sort of maybe even saying to them well well what is your concern you know yeah. are you concerned for example about the the sanctity of the body for the physical resurrection at the end of days or you know or, or are you con you know essentially getting to the bottom of that and help and working that into this whole conversation as opposed to just ignoring it kind of thing i think so and, and, and that's already there where, where it can be shown for example where you find uh, and it, happen, it will happen in, in Britain uh, and has happened in Britain, uh, for example, where you find Jewish burials, mm, mm. Uh, which are clearly identifiable and, uh, uh, and, and there uh, the, you know, the Jewish authorities have been involved directly straight away. You know, it, it's, it, it's a given that in those circumstances, those views will be taken into account. So mm. we're not, it, it, it's not giving, you know, uh, a self, uh, a, uh, you know, a self-identifying modern druid, a veto over work in uh, at Stonehenge and Avebury, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it is saying that everybody's got a right as a human being to make an input input into this, and in the end, like in, like in everything else in archaeology and, uh, 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 and, and life, to be honest, what we probably end up with is a messy compromise. But in the end. The science and the scholarship has a real value, and that's why it's worth doing. But in the end, we can only do it by consent. Mm. Mm. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, as I say, thank you for help, helping me to explore this issue. And uh, and yeah, I, th I think I probably will return to it. I'll, you know, I'll go, I'll check out some other people and and see see where else we may go because I, I'm 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 sure that there'll be. Uh, in fact, I know fine well a few people who will have very strong opinions in terms of. As I say, just the, just the necessity of human remains. So yeah, this this, this is a topic that we we will return to. But for today, thank you very much, Andy. Thank you. Well, thank, thanks for again. It's it's just talking about it like this has made me think about things again, and I think that's all for the good for everybody. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, 
hopefully at home you guys uh, have been given plenty of food for thought as well uh, please do comment below to, to continue the conversation uh, if there's anything particularly pertinent we will attempt to answer uh, in uh, as well in, in the comment section uh, but as, as ever keep it civil uh, keep it clean and uh, and it'd be, yeah it's this it's it is a, a universally interesting conversation Absolutely. anyway as ever until next time do take care bye 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 bye